Welcome back to the Max Reality. If you've seen my face before, then you know the drill. But if you're new here, I love talking all things reality TV and friends. Today is the day the sun is shining, the tank is clean. Yes, it is time to talk about season 16 of Shark Tank, episode 1. Bow, bow, bow. Our sharks for the episode are Damon, Kevin, Lori, Mark, and our brand new guest shark, Rashawn Williams, who is a minority owner of the Atlanta Falcons and venture capitalist. Our first pitch is Little Saints. Entrepreneur Megan walked into the tank looking for $500,000 for 5% of her functional mushroom mocktail. Here it is. Like I said, it is a mocktail drink that uses functional mushrooms to help give you the chill feeling you're looking for. She modeled the cans after different classic cocktails, and then she has her mocktail spirit. This is actually pretty good. That is very yeah, good. Yeah, it is good. It's tasty. Have like Ooh. a stressful day. Okay. Oh. I know, Mark, I'm having. <laughs> that's not my kind of taste. I, yeah, yeah, that's not, not my kind of either. taste. And you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, okay, but what is a functional mushroom mocktail supposed to be? Pretty much she was looking for a mocktail sort of drink because like a lot of people she was trying to lower the amount she was drinking but she still wanted something that like gave her feel good vibes and tasted like the drinks that she used to drink and so she took what's called functional mushrooms and made these drinks now you still may be like what is functional mushrooms <sighs> to my understanding i'm not a doctor i'm not a scientist i don't know the big difference is there's like psychedelic mushrooms, which is what you would be thinking about when somebody's like, I did mushrooms like drugs. And then functional mushrooms are things that have antioxidant powers. They're used in like herbal type supplements. It's mushrooms like lion's mane. I don't even know other ones that are accessible. They're legal. They're FDA fine to consume. That is the difference between those two things. And like I said, they're supposed to have different effects like calming and anxiety and heart health and all these other different additives. Time to get into my favorite part, the numbers. We'll start with the cost of the product. The only product we do a cost breakdown for is her spirit bottle. It retails for $49.99 and it costs seven to make. But if you include shipping and fulfillment costs, it ends up actually being $23 to make. But those aren't the only numbers we get. We also get her customer acquisition cost, which is $42. Her return on advertised spend, which is 2.5 for the year currently when they were filming. And then her long-term value of customer, which is $160. I love when we get like all the information. I just... That's what I live for. Now, like the sharks, you may be thinking to yourself, this is a $10 million valuation, so what are the sales? In the last 12 months, they had done $5 million. In the year of 2024 specifically, they had done $4 million. And in that year, they only lost $160,000. This is an improvement, though, because back in 2022, they did $500,000 in sales and lost 1.1 million yeah wild i knew once this company started getting explained in the beginning that it wouldn't be a profitable company but to be fair to her she does say that by the end of the month when she was filming they're supposed to be breaking even so i will give her the credit that it is getting better I can't, I, you know, I can't say that for other Shark Tank businesses on there, so I have to give points where I can. At the time of filming, she had $200,000 in the bank and $600,000 in receivable. She had put in $1 million and she had raised $1.2 million. At one point, she had raised it for $6 million, and then in 2023, she raised it at a $9 million valuation, and she also has debt of a credit line of $650,000. So far, she has drawn $500,000 of it. And one thing I will say, we did get a very clear picture of the numbers, which again, I have to give points where I can. We got a lot of clear numbers, straight answers. Do love that. Not a huge fan of the numbers, but that's okay because I'm not a shark. And our guest shark, Rashawn, hears all the numbers 
and is immediately interested and decides to offer $500,000 for 10%. She, of course, is unhappy with this because it cuts her valuation in half and also the valuation is equivalent to what they'd made in the last 12 months. And while the math is good there, the math starts to break down when she decides to make a counter offer. <laughs> so she starts it off talking about how it'd be great if she didn't have to keep raising money. So she proposes in her counter offer to do a line of credit for $2 million that she will pay interest on and then do $500,000 for 5%. Now, does anybody see what's wrong with that? I'll give you a minute. Yes, my friends, she is counter offering the exact offer she came in with, but plus more money. <laughs> We're going in just like the complete opposite direction. I love when this happens because it's like, what, where have you gone? Like, wh what happened here? What was the breakdown of why are we asking for more? What this is where he is. You were here. He was here. And now for some reason, you're like here. Why? And they kind of go back and forth for a bit. And Damon's response to this is so funny. And it's literally exactly what I shout every time somebody comes in with one of these offers and literally zero wiggle room or ideas of ways to negotiate. You thought you were gonna come in here and it was gonna be just giving you exactly what you want? No, she wants more now too. Then Lori jumps in and just hits the ground running this season with just fantastic, quotable, clippable Lori lines, just giving us a banger to start out with. I love the kind of woman that when her feet hit the ground in the morning, the competition says, oh crap, she's up. This literally almost put me in tears. It made me laugh so hard. I will say also, I had no idea it was like an actual saying. So I just thought this came straight from Lori's brain. Either way, it's hilarious though. I love Lori, please never change. However, while Lori loves her go get em attitude, she goes out for a reason that feels really random, but she did give it to us a couple times last season too, so I know it's consistent. And that is the fact that Lori can't like handle citrusy drinks. They do not agree with her. And Lori likes to be able to really use and promote and stand behind her products. And so she can't use it. She doesn't really want to invest in it. So she is out. For Damon, he is a simple man and he gives the simple reason of her valuation is just way too high and he is also out. Then Mark jumps in to talk about how he doesn't really like to invest in medicinal products. And she immediately counters this by talking about how her products are FDA gross, which just means generally recognized as safe. Um, so I don't think she quite understood what Mark was trying to say, and he continues to go out. I have a rant about this, but we're going to pin it for now and put it at the end while I'm talking about things. So don't forget, okay, put a pin in this, the FDA gross medicinal stuff. <laughs> then it's Kevin's turn, and he says he's really struggling with this because he did have an offer for her, but he doesn't really feel like it's worth it anymore because she is currently struggling with the idea of 10%, and what he was gonna offer is $500,000 for 15%. Then he decides to test the waters with her and make the suggestion of him and Rashawn going in together for $500,000 for 15%. But she is sticking to her guns. She says she wants to be able to get the value for what she's worked so hard on and that if they're going to value the company at 3.5 million, she's going to have to say no. And then Kevin actually decides to negotiate again, offering to go down to 10% for the two of them, which absolutely shocked me. I was like, uh-huh. And her response to this it's, I, I get that she's just kind of like making a joke, but it just felt so on brand for the type of company this is. I just, ugh. Let me check in with my intuition for a second here. Would you guys give me a minute? Literally, my eyes got stuck from rolling so hard. It was just so uncomfortable to watch. But then her intuition tells her that she should counter 10% for $1 million. You may notice that this is still the same valuation that she came in asking for at the beginning that all the sharks thought was way too high, so they immediately shut this down. No, no. Really? Mark, you can do it if you want. Kevin and Rashawn stay firm with their offer of 10% for $500,000, but she is also not budging and leaves the tank without a deal. So right off the bat, 
I knew this wasn't going to be one of my favorites because I am never into the weird medicinal stuff that comes on to Shark Tank. No offense to you if you want to use it. That's fine. It's your body. I'm not your mom. I'm not the police. I don't care. I just don't like seeing it on Shark Tank. I don't like seeing it advertised. I just, I'm just not, I'm just not really into all that. On top of that, it being one of those companies where you just have to just dump cash into it, burn a bunch of money because you're just needing to be the first one out there, get the biggest name, get the most marketing, and like that's how you win. I get that's how a lot of business works nowadays, but it doesn't mean I have to like it or want to see it on Shark Tank. So both of those things together made me immediately start out the episode with a bias. So on the note of medicinal, back to what I said to put a pen in or taking the pen out. I just really got hung up on the fact that when Mark started bringing up the medicinal stuff, her answer to that was to say the FDA gross thing because it's just too totally different like answers it's like she just like didn't hear what mark said honestly because being generally recognized as safe has no bearing on if the mushrooms do the different things they say that you say that they do it's just it's just completely different things they're talking about and it just honestly made me so annoyed because so many of these kind of weird supplement companies people doing stuff like this love to hook on to those sort of things about the FDA and it's like great I'm so glad it's food safe but like ah, that's 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 all like food safe is such a low barrier it's like I don't know it just it got me so frustrated and it's been like the main thing I've like wanted to talk about and been thinking about since watching the episode I was just sitting there like huh and just like with all of these companies they walk that weird line of wanting to be just like a casual anybody can buy it it doesn't need to be looked at for being able to do stuff but they also want to make the claims that it can do stuff but also if you read their disclaimer it isn't used for anything medical it can't it can't do any of that but it'll also make you chill it's just it's so much back and forth and it just makes me feel very uneasy about all these companies again it's your body. Do what you want to do. I just feel like, I, I don't know, I don't really trust any of these businesses. I'm just going to be 100% real about it. I, I don't get it. <laughs> and I keep saying businesses because the other thing about this whole thing is what she's doing is not necessarily unique. There are so many of these functional mushroom type drinks that are being targeted toward people who want to drink less alcohol. I get ads for them like all the time. I have seen so many versions of this drink right now which again goes back to the point of this just being one of those things where you have to just dump a bunch of money into the marketing and hope that your brand is the trendiest and the best and I just not into that not about it and I just want to make a clear distinction between there being two categories of these like mocktail type drinks that are popular right now there's the category that this one falls into of people putting different supplements, foods, herbs, whatever that are supposed to make you feel something to give you a different but similar like social fun sort of thing. Make you feel chill, make you feel giggly, whatever the different things do. And then there's just like normal mocktails that are drinks designed to be, again, replaced for alcohol but don't have any like promises of benefits of doing things they're just like a, a wine that tastes like wine but has no alcohol in it very different things big supporter of the normal mocktail stuff love me a non-alcoholic beer this stuff is what worries me though <laughs> to wrap this one up i had a feeling from the minute it began that she wasn't going to end up making a deal it felt very much like this is what i'm coming in for if i don't get it i don't get it I don't care. If they don't see what I add, it's fine. So I wasn't shocked when she left without a deal. And it'll be interesting to see if this is even around in a couple years. Who knows? Well, I'd love to see how many of these companies stay around and what the future of maybe regulation and things will 
do for them. It'll be very interesting. Our second pitch of the night is True Fit Customs. Matthew walked into the tank looking for $750,000 for 5% of his direct-to-consumer custom fit sports mouth guards. Here it is. They send you this kit in the mail so you can make your own impression. Then they 3D print it and send you back your own custom mouth guard. It costs them $31 to make and it retails for $95. I went on their website and like we see a lot on this show, on the website it says it's $125, but it's crossed out on sale for now for $95. I would assume, just based off everything I have seen, I used to be under the impression that, you know, maybe they upped their prices, and so they're doing a sale right now because they were on Shark Tank. But <laughs> I've grown wiser after doing this for so long, and honestly, it just tends to be that this is one of those companies that always do that. The products are always on sale, so it always looks like a better deal than it is. Because if it was the other case, the best way to do it would be like code Shark Tank, because they even have that right now. They have a code that you can get like 30% off with using Shark Tank and then they're $95. They're not, it's just, it's just, it's just the math, the math maths for, I think they just are $95 and they like to pretend they're on sale. I'm just saying, feel how you will about that. <laughs> They've been in business since 2022. And with this one, we get a fun little sales ramp. In 2022, they did $115,000. In 2023, they did $750,000. And in 2024, they're expected to hit $1.4 million. He says they are profitable. That's all he says about that. So we don't really get a lot of information like we did with the other girl about debts and things like that. We do, however, know that he has raised a million dollars at a $7.5 million valuation. The first question, and rightfully so, is... The fact that there is a lot of competition in this specific market and they want to know what exactly makes their company stand out. He says their biggest sell is their digital manufacturing and their ability to understand and scale custom fit fabrication products. By digital manufacturing, he's talking about using a combination of 3D printers and robots to manufacture these items efficiently and automatically. After going over all the numbers, the sharks for the most part still feel like the valuation is just completely ridiculous at $15 million. And this guy has done his Shark Tank homework and brings up to Kevin how Kevin did his dissertation on the dental industry and how there's always been three main players that control everything. If you're a big Shark Tank fan, we've heard this time and time again from Kevin. So, you know, good doing your homework. And I think his main point in bringing all of this up is that since the market has changed a bunch, they can be part of this new demographic that's stealing share from those three businesses. I think that was the point he was trying to get to at the end. But honestly, I like made a note that I was kind of confused where this train of thought was going exactly. It might be one of those things where there might have been a clear end of the train, but just with the way it was edited, I was like, I don't really, I don't know where the station was pulling in here, but that's my assumption. However, this does not sway Mark in the slightest, who still thinks the valuation is completely ridiculous to the point that he doesn't even know where he would begin to negotiate. So he goes out and then gives us a 10 out of 10 line from Damon. Listen. When a guy who just put another 3.5 billion in his pocket said the valuation is too high, it's really too high for me. <laughs> While Damon and Mark might be out, other sharks are still interested and want to know his plans to continue to grow the business. And he talks about one of the main things they're doing is they provide mouth guards to different sports teams and then they'll reach out to athletes on an individual level to partner up and do affiliate sponsorships with them. Kevin loves the product, but like everybody else, hates the valuation. So he offers a very on-brand Kevin offer, which is $750,000, but he's gonna lower the equity to 3%, not out of the kindness of his own heart, but because in true Mr. Wonderful fashion, this deal has a royalty of 
$2 a unit until he's paid back $2,250,000. I think that's a bad offer. Kevin tells us that at his current rate, it would take four years to pay Kevin back, which just feels so wild to me. Honestly, overall, it's not the craziest Mr. Wonderful offer, in my personal opinion. I mean, I feel like there have been way wilder ones. While this might not be a super, like, cash-free business, so probably royalty isn't the best option for them, I, I, I wasn't too shocked, honestly, just because of who Kevin is and because of what this man brought in as the first offer anyway. Then Lori jumps in to kind of say what everybody is saying and feeling, which is number one, the valuation is just completely ridiculous. Number two, she wishes that there was more proof of this working and really making money. And lastly, it would take her forever to get her money back. And for all those reasons, she's out. Then we have our new guest shark, Rashawn, start giving this really weird analogy about different investments being like motorcycles or rockets and how normal investments are like motorcycles and they take regular fuel to make them happen. But what venture capital does is give you rocket fuel for rockets. And this might not be a rocket yet, but Rashawn does see the potential for this to be a rocket. Honestly, this was such a weird introduction to this man. This whole analogy was just, it was odd. I, I like get it, but it also was just, uh, huh? It honestly felt like if you were trying to write like a venture capitalist character into a TV show, this feels like something they would say. Like it almost felt fake. It was so funny to me. One thing I will say I appreciated though was him just kind of flat out talking about some different things with venture capital, like the fact that he understood why this man was coming in with a 15 million valuation because he'd been told by other venture type capitalist investors that he needs to double what his valuation was the last round so like while he might not agree with the valuation he understands it and I, I appreciated him just flat out being like no I understand why you came in with this number it's not right but I get it <laughs> and through all of this Rashawn decides to give him an offer of $750,000 for 10% with the added element that he wants to bring in 10 to 20 athletes to be potential ambassadors or maybe investors. The greed, the greed. I have never yeah, seen greed. If you say like no that. to that, I thought I was being generous. Yeah, greed. Actually, if you say that no to that, sounds smart to me. And honestly, the fact that this man didn't just drop to the ground and say yes did shock me. Instead, though, he counters $1 million for 8%. I will start off by saying, I do always feel like you're free to counter once. So, you know, I'll give him that. And I will even give him credit that his math is slightly better than our previous entrepreneur because the valuation is slightly less than the one he came in asking for. However, he is asking more money, less equity still, which the Sharks are never fans of. And unsurprisingly, Rashawn says no to that. And after giving it a little thought, Matthew decides to go ahead and take the deal with Rashawn for $750,000 for 10% and we get our first deal of the season. So the first thing I'll say is something the Sharks brought up, which is there is a lot of competition in this space right now for custom night guard, mouse guard, sports ones, you name it. This like direct to consumer model for these sort of things is super popular right now. However, Maybe his is better than the other ones in the market. I obviously can't speak to that. One thing I will say, though, is he was wearing one while he did the beginning of his pitch and then, like, popped it out toward the end. And I personally did think that was very impressive. Now we can talk about what I really want to talk about, which is I dislike all this venture capital stuff so much. So so much. I literally cannot describe to y'all. I understand. It is very popular and it is a big segment of investing and in business, but that doesn't mean I have to like it or want to see it on Shark Tank. Like with this one versus the last one, at least he was profitable. I really can't, don't feel super comfortable even speaking on that though, because they did not show us a lot of him talking about that aside from just saying, yes, we're profitable. But 
all of the things Rashad was saying about like just the venture capital aspect of like just pumping up the business at one point, And I quote, this is what this man said. Rashawn said, I don't want you to be profitable at all. I don't want you increasing your expenses. I don't want anything coming off the top because I want you to grow all that revenue and crush your competitors. That's the venture way. And I hate the venture way. So there's that. <laughs> Overall, it might be a very good mouth guard. If it is great. I think Rashawn might be able to help him a lot in the sports avenue, being able to hook him up with those different athletes. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes in the future. Our third pitch of the night is 1587 sneakers. Sam and Adam walked into the tank looking for $100,000 for 15.87% of their culture-focused luxury sneaker brand. Here's what it looks like. Very self-explanatory. They do these luxury sneakers and then also a few other miscellaneous clothing items like some shirts and hats and that sort of thing. The other main component of this business is the branding itself. It's geared toward Asian Americans and celebrating their culture with the name 1587 being the first time that an Asian person stepped foot on what is now North America, starting out with how much the sneakers cost to make. When they were in the tank, they were talking about how they'd started manufacturing them in Italy and there it cost them $110 to make and they were retailing the shoes for $288. However, they said they had plans to move production over to Asia where the cost to make them would drop down to 50 and they would start retailing them for 175. However, it doesn't seem like that's happened. Their website still says they're made in Italy and the pricing for the leather sneakers is still 288. So I don't know what happened with that. Maybe it's still in the works. Who knows? Not me. We also get their customer acquisition cost. We have gotten it for every single business this episode and I just made the realization I did not bring it up with the last business. It doesn't matter. It's not necessarily the world's most important thing, but y'all know I love to share the numbers and his customer acquisition cost is $45. They've only been in business 10 months and in that time they've done $240,000 in sales and they're projected for $500,000 this year. They didn't talk about whether they're profitable or not. I would assume not with how early the business is, but that would just be an assumption. I truly, again, have no idea. I would just guess. To start us out, we find that this is Adam's third sneaker company. What <laughs> happened to the other two? The first one he was just an employee in, but that company did go from $800,000 to $8 million. The second one, however, was another startup. It was a brand that was aimed towards Black Americans, and he says that he learned a lot through that business. So it failed miserably is what you're saying. <laughs> of course, the Sharks want to know what's going to make this business different from the last one. And they say the biggest difference is the messaging behind their brand, which makes Kevin ask this question in this very on-brand Kevin way. Walk me through so, that process. I never heard of you. Snap my fingers. I'm Asian now. How are you going to communicate with me? The two talk about how one of their greatest assets in the business is actually Sam himself. He spent the last 10 years focusing on government and advocacy work for Asian Americans. And through that, he's gained quite a big social media presence. He's got around 250,000 followers on Instagram. However, it's not completely translating over to the business yet as they have about 7,000 followers on Instagram. So then Mark asks the question of what do you need the money for? And they talk about number one, they need cash to help scale. And two, they're interested in getting into the retail market, which all the sharks immediately are vetoing, hate this idea. First, Lori jumps in to say that it's just not the right business for her. Sneakers aren't her thing unless, you know, she's getting on the treadmill or something like that. So she's out. Kevin very similarly says it's just not the business for him. And he also hates the whole idea of wanting to go to retail. So he is also out. Then we have our new guest shark, Rashawn, who I am learning really loves to paint a picture when he's either going in or out about to make an offer. I think this is going to be a pattern we see from him. And it's not one I'm mad at. I enjoy it. I love a bit of some sort. And this is one that I I'm fine with. Listen. In my world, I look at how many points of failure 
are there between now and where this business needs to get to? And the ones that have like three to seven points of failure that we can identify and mitigate and structure around, I'm excited about those. And for you guys, there are like 25 things that need to go right. On top of all those different points he mentioned, he is also worried about their lack of traction in social media and for all those different reasons, he's out. Then we have Damon who's been in the shoe space before and has seen firsthand how difficult it can be and he's not sure he really wants to go on that journey with them. He likes the product but unfortunately he is also out. Last we have Mark who disagrees with Rashawn about how much failure they're gonna see ahead of them. He feels like they just need to focus on their organic growth, the path they're already currently on, ignore that whole retail idea and they'll be fine but because of all that he is also out and they leave the tank without a deal to start off with final thoughts i will give them a point for actually listening to the sharks in their exit interview they talked about how grateful they were for the advice especially all the stuff about retail it really seemed like they actually listened and a lot of different entrepreneurs love to get really defensive especially when it comes into this retail versus not retail argument but they really seem to take it on and absorb it love that for them love that kind of attitude aside from that though i'm gonna be really real y'all i have like no opinions on this one i'm very much like lori i don't really do sneakers i don't really do shoes i mean i i wear shoes but i don't really care what shoes i'm wearing i've been wearing white converse since they got assigned to people in like 2016 or whatever that like re-became popular when just everybody was wearing white converse and i've literally never taken them off my feet pretty much and i i just i it's just i literally just don't i no thoughts no feelings it's expensive shoes if you're into that they might be nice i don't know it's interesting, the whole cultural concept of it, incorporating the whole naming of the 1587. I will also say, I do very much agree with the Sharks and the fact that if they're making it this sort of lifestyle brand, they really should continue to focus on building up that online community. But other than that, I... we'll see where they go. I don't know. That's I really, I wrote, I don't have a lot of thoughts on this one. So that's what I got for you. <laughs> Our last pitch of the night is cardio. Destin walked into the tank looking for $150,000 for 5% of his gamified fitness app. Here's what the app looks like and how he describes it is a team-based turf war capture the flag scenario. You group up into teams and you and your team can run around different areas of town and claim blocks then other teams can run those same paths to capture those same blocks for themselves, pretty much just making an ongoing game of capture the flag and turning your normal cardio into something a little more fun. As for the cost to make and retail, that doesn't really work with this since it's an app. However, it is free to download. Then like a lot of apps nowadays, it has a premium subscription feature. This costs $25 a month per group. So one of his big strategies is to team up with running groups that already have things like monthly membership dues. And so the team can incorporate it all together. It's not like some individual is trying to pay $25 a month to be in the app, if that makes sense. Now, I don't know like the whole ins and outs of like how many people can be on a team and all of that sort of thing that goes into it. I'm just telling you what he told us. Continuing on with customer numbers, he's had 22,000 downloads in 70 countries with 14,000 active users. He's had 400 run groups sign up, and he has a corporate wellness pilot with Oracle. He also told us that they have a 34% 30-day retention rate, so lots of good customer data and phone numbers. He officially started the business in June of 2022, and the only sales information we get is that last month they made $4,000 in sales, and then that's kind of all we get for that. We don't really get profitability, we don't get other numbers. That's all we get, so that's all I can give you. We do, though, find out that he's raised $470,000, and $150,000 of that was a grant from Pokemon Go. 
I don't know about you, but I know when he first started describing this, I was like, oh, that, that gives Pokemon Go vibes. Like, you know, the idea of an app getting you to go outside, claim areas of like physical real land out in the world. So we'll get more into that story in a minute. So off the bat, we get the usual questions such as, what he's going to do to make his app stand out from the other fitness apps out there. Of course, the number one obvious things he brings up is the gamified social aspect of it. The next big obvious question is, how are you going to continue to grow this? And he says that's part of what they need help with. They need help with getting in contact with people who can partner with them and make this bigger. They've already done partnerships with people like the Austin Marathon and San Francisco Marathon, and he's found that that, along with targeting the running groups, is really what will give fuel to this project. Then we get into the story of how this business started, and I just, I was a big fan. So he got the idea in 2020 during lockdown, and he tried to teach himself the engineering necessary so he could do it himself, immediately, very quickly after at least, found out that that was going to be a lot harder than he thought. So he DM'd 400 different engineers. All of them said no, but one of them ended up being the founding engineer for Pokemon Go, and he loved his moxie. And he's like, hey, I can't give you an intro. All I can do is give you our CEO's email. You can shoot your shot and shoot his shot. He did indeed. Eventually, the CEO actually responded and it got Destin on a call with people that he said obviously didn't necessarily want to be there. They were just told they had to be there and they did tell him no. But from this, he learned that the CEO read emails, so he continued to email this man until finally he decided to give him a grant to get him to stop emailing all the time. And 10 out of 10, that's a fantastic story. Mark always talks about like the door knocking entrepreneurs and that's just, that's always my favorite thing. I love, I love panache. I love getting out there, doing it. I don't care if it's just sending email after email, just 10, 10. Fantastic. And keep working on Let it. Let me just tell you, that. that's brilliant that I hate you because now everybody <laughs> out there is going to send us 600 emails a week. Then Lori ends this episode similarly to how she began it, which is giving us another fantastic Lori line. We are truly blessed. That is really amazing. I always say the dream is free and the hustle is sold separately. Love it. Hilarious. 10 out of 10. However, while we do the, get this great line, this app encompasses two things that are just completely out of Lori's wheelhouse, which are running and gaming, so she is out. Of course, since his sales last month were only $4,000, the Sharks are very interested in how he got to the valuation of $3 million, and like so many other businesses that come into the tank, part of why he picked that number is because it was valued at that previously when he had raised money, and on top of that, he's valuing it on the future of what it could be not just what it's worth today, but what it will be one day. Everybody that's ever stood there said the same thing. When and some of them were right, and I think I'm one of them. Mm, that's a good answer. That's First, we have Kevin jump in to say, overall, it's just not a deal for him. It's too early, and he is out. Then Mark comes in to talk about how the biggest issue with this kind of business is keeping it with enough user base to make it always like enjoyable and working because if there aren't a lot of people in the app using an app like this, it kind of takes out the app working since it's a social gaming app. And Mark just isn't sure how he can help him scale that part of the business. And for those reasons, he is also out. Then Rashawn asks Destin what really drives him, and he gives this really sweet answer about his mom and growing up with a stutter and watching the show. It's all very sweet. I'm not gonna get into it. I don't generally get into the personal stories unless they're super relevant, but it was very sweet and it does kind of come up relevancy-wise in a minute. After this, Rashawn is convinced that he wants to make him an offer and wants Damon to partner up with him. He thinks that Destin is a great salesperson and can eventually become a great business person with the right mentorship and having access to capital. Damon is immediately eager to jump in. He talks about how Destin reminds him a lot of him and instead of emailing, Damon was just doing the same thing, cold calling people over and over again, hearing a bunch of no's until he gets the yes. So Rashawn starts the offer by saying, 
So remember, this situation is 1 plus 1 equals 5. So our offer is $150,000 for 15%. And at the heart of it, I get what, what Rashawn was trying to say with that at the beginning, but it was just such a funny way to start out that offer and start everything up. Why are you waiting? Destin decides he would like to counter the $150,000 for 10%. No, yeah. Destin! <laughs> I love it though, I love the guy. Dusty, no, come on, man. No, but I love the guy's hustle. I love it. And like I said earlier, I never knock anybody for doing one counter. I feel like all the sharks can moan and go, uh, all they want, but they should get to counter once, especially if it's respectful and demure and mindful like his was. While they do appreciate the spirit of Destin, you know, trying to negotiate a deal, the sharks do decide they're going to stay firm with their original offer. But Destin has one more question to ask, which is, can he go ask his mom about the deal? Because she is out in like the lobby area waiting and they're all like, actually just bring her in here so she can talk some sense into you. Kevin at one point was literally like, your mom is screaming in the lobby to take the deal. I can hear her. And Destin brings her in and she immediately was like, Kevin, you were right. I was doing that, which was just such a great moment for me. I <laughs> thought it was so funny. And with the support of his mom at his side, Destin ends up taking the deal with Rashawn and Damon for $150,000 for 15%. Number one off the bat, I 100% love deals like this. This is my personal what I think Shark Tank should be. Just a normal company, somebody trying to do something, trying to make it work. They're given the chance they need. Hopefully it works out. And that was very healing to end on after some of these other businesses. And there's the argument, the divide among Shark Tank watchers of like what Shark Tank should be. And there are people who would classify this as like the charity tank because he hasn't really proven a lot of sales. And I will give that part about the proof of sales isn't great, but he is like a young kid who needs mentorship. And I've always loved those kind of deals. They're always great to me. I don't care. And I don't think it's just charity tank. And I don't, I don't even really love that term. I do think sometimes it is applicable, but I feel like the way it generally gets used, don't love it. Not a huge fan. So very much like the sneakers, um, I don't run. I am 100% the not demographic for this. My partner and I recently bought a walking pad because of this sort of thing, because of not wanting to like go outside because of different weather stuff or not wanting to figure out going to a gym. So I'm just like, I fundamentally don't really understand this. I do. I conceptually get it. Like, I feel like if I did run, I would like it. But since I don't, I don't really feel like I can speak on it some. Like literally, I was one of those people who did like Pokemon Go, but I just don't leave the house a lot. And so I never progressed really far. And it did make me get out more. But I don't think this would because I don't already like running. I would need the motivation of something I already like. So if you're on the same train with me still, my train has moved around a little. But since I liked, since Pokemon Go made me get out because I like Pokemon, I feel like if I liked running, this app would make me get out. There we go. I concluded it. It just took us a minute to get there. On the Shark Tank product discussion Reddit thread for this one, I did see different people arguing about its similarity or dissimilarities to an app called Strava. I looked it up and I do think there are things that are different about it. Like for example, it looks like the Strava app. It, it has routes that you can run and you're trying to be like the fastest in that route it's not really about like the claiming territories like he is so i think that would probably be the biggest difference again i've never used either of these this is just from like what i'm seeing however i could see the argument of this is something a bigger app could incorporate but that's also room for the bigger app maybe going to him and being like hey can we buy whatever you've been working on so could be good thing, could be bad thing, just information for you to food for thought. Overall, I was really excited that he got a deal. I hope Rashawn and Damon are able to give him that mentorship and he's able to grow and flourish. And I was very happy that we ended our premiere episode on this one because it warmed my heart. It was a great way to end, in my opinion. And that is a wrap. 
for our premiere episode of season 16 of Shark Tank. I think it was another good one in the books. I'm very interested to see how the season will play out. We have some new guest sharks coming in. It is also Mark Cuban's very last season. They've announced that Daniel Lebensky, a previous guest shark of many years, will be replacing him. So it'll be interesting to see Mark in his kind of like retirement senior year era. I could already kind of feel it this episode. And it'll be interesting to see how it progresses. I'll also be interested to see if Mark is in every single episode like he was last season. Part, part of me thinks he will be because I want to use him as much as possible before he's gone. And then part of me thinks they'll be trying to purposely put him kind of in less, maybe at the end or maybe in the middle, trying to do some like, see, the show will be fine without him. Time will tell. Who's to say? Not me. As always, I want to hear your thoughts feelings, opinions, all that and more down below. Have you tried any of these products? Did you know this was Mark Cuban's last season? Do you think they're ever going to talk about it or do you think he's just going to disappear? Let me know all that and more below. And until then, I'll see y'all in the next one. <music>